Our next speaker is Paul Niemeyer. He's an associate professor of English at Texas A&M U International University in Laredo. He's flown all the way over from Texas, especially to speak for us today, where he teaches 19th and 20th century British literature. And he's also been named the College of Arts and Sciences Most Distinguished Teacher of the Year. He's best known for his book, Seeing Hardy, which was the first book-length study of Hardy and film. And he's continued to be published on that subject, as well as Somerset Maugham and Anthony Hope. I first met Paul way back in 2012. We've been friends ever since. We share the same birthday, and he sends me Day of the Dead Skulls from Mexico, and I send him Dorset Fossils. I think it's a fair exchange. So without further ado, may I please introduce Paul Niemeyer. Tracy, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And I don't think it's false modesty when I say I don't think I deserve that, no. Um, I need to set up my PowerPoint here, so, and... I'm, I'm going to rely on his technical expertise. And in fact, um, I have a couple of uh, technical points to bring up about my presentation. For one thing, the title in your program is not correct. And as my students would say, that's my bad. Um, Tracy, about a month ago, maybe even longer than that, asked for titles. And I didn't have one. And I had this flash of inspiration to use a passage from the novel. And so I said, here's what we'll call it. And then two weeks later, I looked at the passage. I said, oops, I got it wrong. Uh, there's no N in my title. Uh, you can see it. Uh, what Very top one, what we see him. There we go, yes. Uh, no, it's a PowerPoint. It's a word. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Sorry, close that. It's, it's mayor presentation. No, it's, you know what? I'm now afraid we don't have my file. Boy, I am having, guess what? We don't have a PowerPoint here. It's okay. PowerPoint is not the answer to everything. Yeah. So, well, I gave you my word file. I am really having a good trip here. Thank you. Um, well, the PowerPoint was pretty good, but hopefully we... Uh, we don't need it now. <laughs> uh, I was going to tell you the other problem was that I was going to have film clips for you. And I spent a lot of time educating myself on burning film clips. And I did all this work, and then I found out I couldn't embed them into my PowerPoint, which I don't even have. Um, so what I'm going to have to do is do a lot of acting. I do a lot of that anyway. I will just rely on my own self. This is called What We See Him, Projections of Manliness in Two Film Adaptations of Far From the Matting Crowd. As Trish Ferguson just told us, uh, Far From the Matting Crowd is the 10th most popular love story of all time. And with that in mind, it should not come as a surprise that Far From the Matting Crowd has been the most popular film uh, of from Hardy's novels. There have been two major film adaptations in the era of sound and all those other things we associate with it. And it was also used as the basis of Stephen Freer's Tamara Drew, which itself is adapted from Posey Simmons' same-named graphic novel that rewrites Hardy's Madding Crowd in modern terms. Inevitably, questions come to mind as to why Far From the Madding Crowd has been so often filmed, although I think we have explained it how the two straight films differ as adaptations, and how ultimately each film relates to and even conveys an understanding of Hardy and his works. The why and the how can perhaps be explained in that both adaptations, John Schlesinger's sprawling 1967 epic and Thomas Vinterberg's compact 2015 version, appeared at moments in Western cultural history when issues of gender roles were noticeably shifting and being debated or even challenged. As many critics have observed, 
Hardy's novel also appeared at a time when radical shifts in British culture, primarily owing to imperial expansion, corporate capitalism, and the end of tra- traditional agricultural and artisan work, brought about changes in familial and community structures, and ultimately, the way men's and women's roles were constructed and perceived. Bathsheba Everdeen, an independent-minded woman of the 19th century who finds herself with property and power in what had previously been exclusively a man's world, would seem an ideal figure onto whom film viewers in both 1967 and 2015 could project their own understandings of changing women's roles. Both Schlesinger and Winterberg cast in the role of Bathsheba women who seemed to be particularly of the moment. Julie Christie, fresh from winning a Best Actress Oscar for Schlesinger's Darling in 1965, and from having played Lara in David Lean's epic Dr. Zhivago, and whose look and style were influencing women around the world for the 1967 film. Carrie Mulligan, widely acclaimed as the next great British actress since her BAFTA award-winning role in An Education in 2009, and having recently played Daisy Buchanan in Baz Luhrmann's adaptation of the quintessential American novel, The Great Gatsby, for Vinterberg's film. With the right Bathsheba for each era cast, the filmmakers then had to find a romantic interest for Bathsheba, who would also speak to contemporary changing visions of masculinity. The problem each director faced in finding the proper match for Bathsheba can be understood by looking at the ways each director, and of course each screenwriter, adapts chapter 10 of Hardy's novel, when Bathsheba first gathers together the farm hands, announces the termination of the absent bailiff Pennyway's services, and that she herself will assume his duties, and finally delivers the famous declaration, Now mind you have a mistress instead of a master. I don't yet know my powers or my talents in farming, but I shall do my best, and if you serve me well, so shall I serve you. I shall be up before you are awake, I shall be afield before you are up, and I shall have breakfasted before you are afield. In short, I shall astonish you all. In the Schlesinger film, made as second wave feminism was carving inroads into women's demands for workplace equality, Julie Christie's Bathsheba is presented in the corresponding scene very much as an uncertain newcomer to a world where she had not before been made welcome. And at this point, there would be a non-existent film clip in a non-existent PowerPoint. So I will have to describe it for you. She delivers a variation on the I shall astonish you all speech shortly after she first enters the room that this is less a confrontation to the workers than a request to be accepted as an employer who is on the same level as her late uncle, is immediately illustrated when she holds up a sack of money and promises each worker a 10-pound bonus if they stay on the farm with her. As the scene continues, with Bathsheba learning each character's name and position before she hands over the reward, she seems to grow in confidence. During the scene, as in the novel... Henry Frey is at her side, uninvited, and providing unasked-for information on each worker. Finally, politely but firmly, Bathsheba orders Henry to sit down. With this dismissal, Bathsheba becomes a new woman, perhaps one less of 1874 than 1967, politely asserting her right to a a place in a man's world, inviting and paying others to accept her in it, and finally pushing away a man who thinks she obviously needs his help. Vinterberg's film, made nearly 50 years after Schlesinger's, is a product of an era where women have a stronger and more assured place, not just in the workplace, but in a larger global community. Moreover, it comes from a period when the privileges of patriarchy are no longer to be taken for granted, but are openly challenged and subject to dismantling. In an interview around the time of the film's release, Carrie Mulligan called Bathsheba a feminist character. She's a modern, modern woman. For a reader and then as an actor to get to play her, what's exciting is that she is so completely out of her time. She just shouldn't be living then and is bucking trends left, right, and center. Mulligan's Bathsheba at the start of the film subsumes her femininity by wearing leather jodhpurs and a, quote, suspiciously modern-looking leather jacket from Fuller and then abandoning riding her horse side saddle to ride it as would a man. Her scene where she faces the farmhands begins as she is already in the process of paying the workers, no mention of her negotiating to win their favor, 
and it quickly moves into a confrontation as she publicly charges the present bailiff Pennyways with dereliction of his duties and forcefully announces his dismissal. As Bathsheba proceeds to make her case to him and the watching farm workers that she will do the bailiff duties herself, Pennyways leans over her and tries to drown out Bathsheba's argument with his own that she can't possibly handle the farm alone. But it becomes clear to him and to us that Bathsheba will not be moved. A viewer today cannot help but notice that the hulking Pennyways violation of Bathsheba's personal space as well as his crude mansplaining of the situation. Bathsheba's I shall astonish you all speech is delivered as a triumphal coda to her defeat of the fired bailiff, a movement that removes all doubt that she is in charge, though after the workers leave the room, she has to lay her head on her arms and sigh in obvious relief. In both versions of the scene, we see the filmmaker's admiration for Bathsheba's ability to hold her own against a man who, through demonstrations of patronizing behavior, fray, or outright hostility, Pennyways, shows that he cannot handle her authority. Both scenes also showcase how difficult it is for a narrative purposes, even following Hardy's storyline, and for film casting for Bathsheba to find the right man. Judith Mitchell has charged that Hardy's male characters lack vibrancy and therefore are less interesting to filmmakers than are the females. It is perhaps with a similar thought in mind that each director creates a suitable mate by choosing a man from the novel and then proceeding to invigorate him with popular images of manliness from each era. The Schlesinger film, seeming to take the literary Bathsheba's declaration of I want somebody to tame me literally, presents Sergeant Troy, played by Terran Stamp, as the perfect man to bring the newly liberated Bathsheba to heel. This Troy is imbued with the strength of two 1960s male icons, the posthumously dubbed leader of the 1960s sexual revolution, D.H. Lawrence, and especially his interpretation of Troy as a man who treats Bathsheba badly, never loves her, though he is the only man in the book who knows anything about her, and especially Sean Connery's James Bond, who counters and invariably defeats modern women's lib with old-fashioned charm, sex appeal, and disinterest in individual women. Tellingly, the liberated spark of Christie's Bathsheba is worn away by Troy's rakishness, cavalier behavior, and eventual cruelty. The nearly shattered woman who marries Gabriel at the end of the film is far different from the women's liber, we get at the start. In 2015, the idea of a man wearing down a woman with his charm or anything else would be considered tasteless at least and probable cause for a hashtag campaign. Even James Bond himself, now played by Daniel Craig, shows his greatest loyalty as to the woman played by Judy Dench who orders him to undertake life or death missions. So in the Vinterberg film, a more sensitive and understanding match for Bathsheba must be found. In this case, the filmmakers labeled to make it clear Gabriel, played by Matthias Schoenartz, is the right man all along, usually quiet, always handy around the farm, and respectful of Bathsheba's authority, but not willing to be walked on. This Gabriel is at home with many of the male romantic leads in, the, in, in films of the last quarter century or so. The guys who work at traditional, rugged, manly jobs and who also succeed in being deeply sensitive emotionally, impossibly beautiful physically, and are magnificent lovers, and who have been most notably portrayed by such actors as Brad Pitt and, more recently, Ryan Gosling. Of course, there is a third man Bathsheba must contend with, Farmer Boldwood the wealthy older bachelor whose affections she inadvertently wins after she sends him a notorious joke valentine and who will pursue an obsession with Bathsheba that ends in his murdering Troy. The two films are most different in their understanding and especially their casting of this character. In the Schlesinger film, Boldwood is portrayed by Peter Finch as a stoic figure from an earlier generation whose thwarted romance with Bathsheba leads him down the spiral into tragedy of Shakespearean dimensions. In Vinterberg's film, Michael Sheen plays Boldwood as less differentiated from the other characters by age than by a simple inability to understand his place in life, a trait that makes him as pathetic as it makes him tragic. 
Finch and Sheen are each excellent in their very different interpretations of Farmer Boldwood, and both performances succeed in capturing particular fears about manliness. In Finch's Boldwood, that of the older generation being superseded by one that is more radical and daring, while Sheen's Boldwood captures the plight of what has been labeled the beta male. In truth, both performances, as different as they are, manage to capture some aspect of Hardy's Boldwood, yet the performances are perhaps best understood as projections of fears about masculinity from their own eras. But herein lies the rub. The use of Boldwood mainly as a repository of masculine fears or as a romantic foil who removes one romantic obstacle to free up the correct romantic subject. Certainly, Hardy also puts the literary Boldwood through similar paces, but in dramatizing the rich farmer's obsession with Bathsheba and his failure to compete with Troy, Hardy manages to go beyond simply showing the heartbreak of a disappointed and unbalanced would-be lover. Boldwood's failure in love causes him to effectively disintegrate as a human being. He is reduced to an indefinable elemental state that is terrifying for Bathsheba and disturbing to the reader because it undercuts the romantic project of the novel and is indicative of the disturbingly indefinable quality that is at the heart of existence. Boldwood's subversive fragility is always in danger of breaking free throughout the novel, and it is precisely this destabilizing quality that makes him difficult for filmmakers to dramatize in all his dimensions. Once again, there would have been some great images here to show with this. In the hands of Hardy's narrator, Boldwood would seem to be an easy man to figure out. The austerity of his parlor is likened to a Puritan Sunday lasting all the week. And Boldwood is in the almonry and cloister of his stables is labor, labeled a celibate. Thus aligned with the Puritan and the monk, Boldwood at first glance is a figure of extreme renunciation. And Hardy acknowledges this when he calls him a lonely and reserved man for whom women must be forever out of, meet, out of reach. To Boldwood, women had been remote phenomena rather than necessary components, comets of such uncertain aspect, movement, and permanence, that whether their orbits were as geometrical, unchangeable, and as subject to laws as his own, or as absolutely erratic as they superficially appeared, he had not deemed it his duty to consider. These are characteristics of sexual diffidence or simple shyness, and some have suggested impotence or latent homosexuality. But into this mix, Hardy adds something else, a lack of perspective that keeps Boldwood from truly seeing women. Instead, they had struck upon all his senses at wide angles. This inability to focus also extends to his emotional life. His equilibrium disturbed. He was in extremity at once. If an emotion possessed him at all, it ruled him. A feeling not mastering him was entirely latent. Stagnant or rapid, it was never slow. He was always hit mortally, or he was missed. Hardy lays the symptoms on the table, but he balks at ever defining them, a fact that has left readers since 1874 trying to determine what exactly is Boldwood's problem. In her study of Hardy's male characters, Tracy Hayes has chronicled how critics since Havelock Ellis in 1883 have tried to come up with the correct diagnosis. Hayes highlights Ellis himself identifying Boldwood's hopeless passion for Bathsheba as a want of reality. Later in the 20th century, Rosemary Morgan will label him a mentally unbalanced celibate, and Rosemary Sumner will consider him an early attempt to explore abnormal psychology. Hayes herself identifies Boldwood as suffering from monomania, the male equivalent of hysteria, a moral insanity thought to be caused by a number of factors, including unrequited love, domestic troubles, grief and economic pressures, or simply overwork. Hayes concludes, Boldwood appears to lose both moral character and intellect, representing instead an example of mental emasculation. In a less sympathetic reading, Richard Nemesvari finds Boldwood's nature to be pathological. As such, it associates him with improperly melodramatic excess that neither leads to any kind of self-awareness 
nor provides the possibility of successful integration. In Nemesvari's interpretation, Boldwood cannot adapt to changing cultural discourse, and this pushes him into a ruthless pursuit of Bathsheba that puts him on the same level as most Victorian stage villains. In each example cited, plausible explanations for Boldwood's problems are offered, but Boldwood seems, at least to me, to go beyond any totalizing explanations. Hardy's disinclination to name the problem is actually echoed by Bathsheba's maid, Liddy. After Boldwood's first impertinent appearance at Bathsheba's front door, Liddy remarks of his concern for the missing Fanny Robin, he's a very kind man that way, she says, then cryptically adds, but Lord, there. Liddy's deferral to the non-committal there prods Bathsheba to ask the maid to continue, and she is told, Never was such a hopeless man for a woman. He's been courted by sixes and sevens. All the girls, gentle and simple for miles round, have tried him. Later, after Bathsheba has been apparently snubbed by Boldwood at the corn exchange, Liddy suddenly provides for her a possible explanation for the farmer's hopelessness with women. It is said, but not known for certain, that he met with some bitter disappointment when he was a young man and merry. A woman jilted him, they say. People always say that, and we know very well women scarcely ever jilt men, tis the men who jilt us. I expect it is simply his nature to be so reserved. Simply his nature, Liddy replies. I expect so, miss. Nothing else in the world. It is interesting that in the first instant, Liddy treats Boldwood's behavior as a mystery, and in the second, she is armed with old gossip about it. But in both cases, she allows herself to lapse into uncommitted words and phrases that really do nothing. Boldwood's failures with women can be categorized under a broad, vague there, while Liddy's echoing of Bathsheba's simply his nature suggests that Liddy believes one can interpret Boldwood as one will. No explanation can ever suffice. However, what is at the heart of Boldwood's problem is spelled out as plainly as Hardy can make it in chapter 31, when the farmer confronts Bathsheba after receiving the letter she sent him, telling him their understanding is at an end. Significantly, as will be discussed in more detail later, this scene is dramatized in neither of the films. When he learns that Bathsheba's decision, decision is final, Boldwood bursts out with what Nemesvari calls underlying misogyny and a sense of emasculation. Oh, Bathsheba, have pity on me. God's sake, yes, I am come to that low, lowest stage to ask a woman for pity. Bathsheba responds to him also in gendered terms. There is little honor to the woman in that speech. Boldwood's dishonorable treatment of Bathsheba continues in the chapter with his behavior ranging from begging, I do supplicate to you, bathos, Bathsheba, you are the first woman of any shade I have ever looked at to love, and it is the having been so near claiming you for my own that makes this denial so hard to bear. Fury, would to God you had never taken me up since it was only to throw me down. Self-pity, I tell you all this, but what do you care? You don't care. Selfishness? Why did Troy not leave my treasure alone? Humiliation? Now the people sneer at me. The very hills and sky seem to laugh at me till I blush shamefully for my folly. I have lost my respect, my good name, my standing. Lost it, never to get it again. And finally, threats. I'll punish him. I'll horse whip the untimely stripling for this reckless theft of my one delight. In the space of a few pages, Boldwood goes through multiple moods and as many changes of personality. The child, the beggar, the bargainer, the revenger. Throughout the display, Bathsheba is terrified and capable mostly of entreating him to remember his role as a gentleman. I am only a girl. Do not speak so to me. That she cannot properly articulate what she has witnessed is conveyed by Hardy in the following passage. Bathsheba, 
who had been standing motionless as a model all this latter time, flung her hands to her face and wildly attempted to ponder on the exhibition which had just passed away. Such astounding wells of fevered feeling in a still man like Mr. Boldwood were incomprehensible, dreadful. Instead of being a man trained to repression, he was what she had seen him. What she had seen him. Again, the issue remains deferred. What defines Boldwood's behavior is not named. Bathsheba recognizes only that what had constituted the steady image of the farmer has been consumed in a horrifying exhibition. Interesting, in viewing this display and not comprehending it, Bathsheba's thoughts are never for her own safety. She fears only for Troy, and her thoughts are so taken outside herself and onto her lover that she literally loses herself. After Boldwood leaves her, she gazed upon the star's silent throes amid the shades of space, but realized none at all. Her spirit was far away with Troy. It is as if through seeing Boldwood shattered into numerous forms, her own sense of self also disappears. This moment where Bathsheba witnesses the figurative self-destruction of Boldwood, which leads to her own practical renunciation of her own self, is tantalizingly close to prefigurizing the moment from Nausea by Hardy's fellow admirer of Schopenhauer, Sartre, where Rocatin contemplates the exposed roots of a chestnut tree and hits upon the arbitrariness of meaning, that the function of the root explained nothing. It allowed you to understand in general what a root was, but not at all that one there. That root, with its color, shape, its congealed movement, was beneath all explanation. This arbitrariness in Sartre is, continued to all, is central to all being. We were a heap of existences, Rocatin declares. Uncomfortable, embarrassed at ourselves, we hadn't the slightest reason to be there. None of us, each one confused, vaguely alarmed, felt superfluous in relation to the others. And I myself, soft, weak, obscene, digesting, juggling with dismal thoughts, I too was superfluous. Certainly Hardy, at least in Far From the Matting Crowd, never goes full-on existentialist. Bathsheba recovers a sense of identity, chastened though she is, and the novel continues on to what is generally taken to be one of the happiest of Hardy's endings. But in suggesting that Boldwood is more than a simple romantic rival, one who, in the words of Graham Fuller, enacts one of the most dissatisfying elements of Hardy's novel, that of the deus ex machina of publicly murdering Troy, and seeing him as a destabilizing force in the narrative of the novel, allows us to realize how close his character comes to mocking the romantic enterprises of not just the bounder Troy, but of the patient Gabriel. The misogynistic brawler Boldwood becomes in some of his phases is not entirely far from the character Troy manages to mask with his charm and polish. Likewise, the self-pity and fear of humiliation that Boldwood openly expresses are the same feelings that Gabriel so manfully manages to keep hidden. Put next to these characters, Boldwood doesn't contrast them. He comes close to complimenting them. Further, Boldwood is given a particular fate in the novel. Rather than be executed for murdering Troy, he is found not guilty by reason of insanity and allowed to live, albeit in an asylum. That Hardy couldn't seem to kill this subversive figure suggests he seemed to understand the power of what Boldwood represents, the arbitrary, artificial nature of romantic drama. Both the 1967 and 2015 adaptations of Far From the Madding Crowd, however, are deeply invested in the project of romance, and the idea of a figure who continually undercuts the project would be out of place. A solution would, would be to just remove Blofe- uh, Blofeld. Good grief. I, I'm also teaching a course in James Bond right now. <laughs> a solution would be to just remove Boldwood, something Hardy himself did in an adaptation of the novel to the stage, but filmmakers found a better way to dramatize his threat by making him a symbol of masculine fears that could easily be understood, if not overcome. <clears throat> and the 
As I addressed at the start of this presentation, the two films based on Far From the Madding Crowd are as much products of their own changing times as the novel was of its own. The social movements that underlie Schlesinger's 1967 film and its depiction of a newly liberated woman have been exhaustively studied and go beyond the scopes of this project. Suffice it to say that the same social currents also inspired a youth movement that informs both what goes on in front of the camera and behind it. Ostensibly, the 67 crowd is a product of the British new wave of the late 1950s and early 1960s, which produced not only John Schlesinger himself, but three of the film's stars, Julie Christie, Terence Stamp, and Alan Bates, none of whom had had a major film role before 1960. Such films offered sober depictions of urban and industrial lives, the so-called kitchen sink school of drama, and even fantasies and comedies, such as uh, Schlesinger's own Billy Liar and Darling, maintained strong footings in working class and laboring realities. Schlesinger himself sounded a realist note when he said that his attraction to Madding Crowd was in that Hardy observed human relationships very truly. He saw life as an endurance contest and felt that when fate or providence, call it what you will, strikes you down, you must pick up the pieces and force yourself to go on. In his focus on the truth of the relationships in the film, Schlesinger often ignores cultural and historical reality. Cast members have recalled how Schlesinger discouraged them from speaking in authentic Dorset accents, though Bates at times gives it a go, and many details are fudged in the characters' costuming and grooming. Christie's Bathsheba is often seen, unlike an actual adult Victorian woman, with long blonde locks flowing, prompting Fuller's quip that several early images of Bathsheba in the field are suggestive of 1960s shampoo commercials. While Stamps Troy, in his bright red coat and with his unkempt too long for the Victorian cavalry hair and mustache, would not look out of place on the cover of a famous Beatles album that was also released in 1967. Even Bates's Gabriel, the most austere of the three young characters, with his chin curtain beard and beaten work clothes, brings to mind many contemporary figures from Haight Ashbury. The youthfulness of this madding crowd, however, is at odds with the form the film takes. Schlesinger's film was also the product of a studio that was desperate for another costume epic on the lines of Dr. Zhivago, and it is to this that we can attribute the film's length of over three hours and its inclusion of such visually compelling but ephemeral scenes as Troy's masquerade as Dick Turpin. It also, continu- uh, it also includes the gurgoyle. It is also the older form of the costume epic that Peter Finch's Baldwin belongs Finch at the time had been in films for over 20 years, and he had established his bona fides in several costume dramas and epics. Compared to the more naturalistic performances of the other leads, Finch seems more mannered and even stagey, but this artificial quality fits right into the film's rhetoric. Again, the film's chief focus is on Bathsheba and Troy. In a film marked by wide panning shots, these two characters are given most of the close-ups. Gabriel, an important figure at the start of the film, disappears for lengthy periods of time as the story of Bathsheba and Troy plays out, and all too often, Boldwood is presented as a strange figure peering in from the sidelines. Finch's Boldwood is further differentiated from the other characters in that, though he was 50 years old at the time, Finch looks much older, owing perhaps to his notorious off-camera hell-raising, and again, he is set off by his mannered, measured acting. Finch is truly brilliant at conveying the repression that Hardy says is part of Boldwood's makeup. The smiles he gives to Bathsheba are forced and even look a little grotesque. And in the scene toward the end of the film where he prepares for the Christmas party, he gives people holiday greetings as if he is programmed to do it. But unlike the Boldwood in the novel, Finch's Boldwood is never allowed to lose his equilibrium. He is always a figure of control. Even in the moment when Troy is shot, Boldwood is never shown shooting and possibly letting his emotions take charge. He is only seen after the shotgun has been fired, holding the weapon with a look of incomprehension on his face. It is no surprise, then, that this Boldwood never self-destructs in front of Bathsheba. In fact, Bathsheba in the film sends him no letter ending the relationship and Boldwood does not confront her about it. 
The end of the affair is conveyed in two scenes, the first of Bathsheba riding past Boldwood's estate, either not seeing or ignoring the man at his front door on her way to Bath, the second riding past Boldwood's fields, again ignoring the gentleman farmer on her return from Bath. Boldwood is also refused entrance to Bathsheba's home by Liddy. It is only when he confronts Troy and offers a bribe for Troy to marry Fanny that Boldwood learns the truth of the marriage. The closest French's Boldwood comes to expressing emotion is in a scene based on the novel's chapter 38. In the film, a shocked Gabriel is inspecting the damage wrought on, by, wrought on Boldwood's farm by the storm. When Boldwood appears to Gabriel, he almost immediately opens up in a near monologue. I've been a weak and foolish man, and I don't know what I can do with this miserable grief. I had some faint belief in the mercy of God before I lost that woman. I know they will laugh at me in the parish. However, no woman's had power over me, Oak. We were never really engaged. I wasn't jilted, whatever they say, was I. I won't give up. I wasn't cheated. She never promised. This speech and Finch's Shakespearean delivery of it highlights Boldwood's wounded pride in his desire to protect both his name and Bathsheba's. But it is certainly not a speech from the character who had come so thoroughly unglued in the novel and which leads to any kind of existential insight. It is, in fact, the speech of a gentleman, a tragic hero from an earlier generation. Certainly, Boldwood's stoicism here and his old-fashioned sense of honor may appeal to the film-going. It is not so clear that he has earned the sympathy of the filmmakers. Aside from his moony-eyed glances at Bathsheba and his pained pronouncement to Gabriel, Finch's Boldwood is often presented as stern, even dictatorial. His control is illustrated in a scene where he eats dinner as he contemplates the valentine sent by Bathsheba. His two Dalmatians rise from their spot and approach him, but with a simple, firm stay from Boldwood, they return to their place. This kind of authority is shown in one of Boldwood's first appearances in the film, in a scene that recalls the steam-driven thresher sequence from Tess of the Durbervilles. Boldwood atop the machine is shown feeding grain into the thresher, as he shouts instructions to his apparently reluctant workers. Boldwood's associations with control and mechanisms are eventually extended to clocks and watches. He is often photographed near timepieces, all signifying artificial attempts to track and possibly control time and ultimately becoming intertwined with Boldwood's fate. In the scene where Boldwood shoots Troy, the ticking of the clock is heard loudly as Bathsheba cries over Troy's body and as the shotgun is pried from the hands of the apparently imperceptive Boldwood. And the ticking soon gives way to the sound of carpenters hammering together Boldwood's coffin in prison. The fate of Finch's Boldwood, presumably hanged at dawn and not rescued by Gabriel's efforts to prove the farmer's insanity, is another indicator of the film's focus on youth. The out-of-touch, materialist, and mechanized older generation is done away with and replaced. This said, Schlesinger does not entirely give way to youthful ideology, for a clock also becomes symbolic of the fate of Bathsheba and Gabriel. At the end of the film, Schlesinger pans from the apparently happy newlyweds in their parlor and stops at the enormous clock that was given to Bathsheba by Troy. That she would keep such a gift is itself questionable, especially when the figure of a red-coated trumpeter comes out of the clock's mechanism to announce the time. This is a moment that reminds us of Hardy's own subversiveness in the novel, both indicating that Bathsheba's mind may never be far from the soldier who tamed her, and especially reminding all that the time that claimed Boldwood will claim us all, all as well. And the final section. The issue of generations that is so prevalent in John Schlesinger's 1967 Far From the Matting Crowd is mostly absent in Thomas Vinterberg's film of 2015. When Boldwood, played here by Michael Sheen, entertains Carrie Mulligan's Bathsheba in his elegant parlor, he asks her, Perhaps you think I'm too old? And in a late speech that will be discussed in more detail later, he characterizes himself to her as a middle-aged man. Otherwise, Boldwood's age is a non-issue in the film, save for a deleted scene included in the DVD Blu-ray extras, 
where Troy, played by Tom Sturridge, taunts Boldwood with the information that Bathsheba told him an old man was in love with her. Contrary to this charge, Michael Sheen is famously youthful-looking, which has served him well in his numerous portrayals of the similarly youthful-looking Tony Blair. And he is familiar to younger audiences through his roles in such cinematic franchises as the Twilight series and the Underworld films. Sheen certainly does not seem separated by a generation from the other actors, as did Finch, so it actually comes as a surprise to find that Sheen, at 45 when he made the film, was just five years younger than Finch when he played Boldwood. Though Sheen wears a full beard in the film and gray was added to his hair, the problem with the character is located in something other than age, and here Venterberg positions Boldwood safely in the discussion of modern masculinity. As was noted earlier, the Vinterberg film focuses on the relationship between Bathsheba and Gabriel, a move that was made, the DVD extra features features tell us, to both differentiate this new crowd from Schlesinger's and because such a romance struck the filmmakers as central to Hardy's novel. The filmmakers' desire to make Gabriel the romantic object of Bathsheba is emphasized in the DVD extras by Mulligan, who rhapsodizes Matthias Schoenartz as being like an old Hollywood movie star. One imagines she is thinking of Gary Cooper, who speaks less like than any other character. And Sturridge gives way to his on-screen rival by saying Schoenartz embodies masculinity. Costume designer Janet Patterson relates that she and the producers rejected putting Gabriel into a period Dorsetshire farmer's smock as it would look too much like a dress. And one couldn't put a, quote, beautiful actor like Matthias Schoenartz into such a garment. Lest there be further doubt, when the recently impoverished Gabriel comes into the town market and encounters a recruiting drive for the cavalry, the sergeant signals him out as a good, strong figure of a man. The interest shown by cast and crew in Schoenart's physical attributes is indicative of a trend in filmmaking since at least the late 1980s that was identified by Peter Lehman and and Susan Hunt, the reduction of male leads into what they call body guys. As the authors explain, in the body guy genre's classic form, a beautiful, intelligent, but discontented woman is engaged or married to a cultured, intellectual, upper-class male. The woman's discontent is quailed when a working-class man, often tied closely to the land, awakens her sexually and energizes her life. The body guy's masculinity and sexuality are so compelling that he rescues the woman from the stultifying world of the successful mind guy who is boring, controlling, and significantly a poor lover who fails to recognize, let alone fulfill, her sexual needs. Lehman and Hunt name as body guys such characters as Leonardo DiCaprio's Jack from Titanic, numerous characters played by Brad Pitt in such films as A River Runs Through It and Legends of the Fall, and even Harvey Keitel in The Piano, the latter for no other reason than his willingness to do, as so many other body guys do, full frontal nude scenes that put his sexual prowess front and center. The authors argue that the body guy is actually derived from a prototype established by Lawrence's gamekeeper Mellers of Lady Chatterley's Lover, and that body guys serve the same function to the women in, the fi- in their films as Mellers does for Connie Chatterley to reinvigorate and reanimate through pure sexuality. Though Schoenart's Gabriel, through his physical beauty and rugged outdoorsman persona, is the ultimate winner of Bathsheba's hand, the film stays true to Hardy's novel by making Troy the man Bathsheba first marries. Yet Troy certainly is not the mind guy who does not deserve his woman. He is in fact another body guy, though clearly of a lower type than Gabriel. In a deleted scene set in Bathsheba's bedroom on the morning of the wedding, Sturridge's Troy is given the ultimate honor of the body guy, lingering shots of his naked backside as he leans over the windowsill and Bathsheba stirs from the tangled bedsheets. He has been triumphant. As it turns out, though, 
Venterberg's film actually answers a complaint from Lehman and Hunt have about body guys, even going back to the original one created by Lawrence, that such figures actually reduce men and women both to shallow beings looking only for one type of sexual excitement, that which can be achieved through heteronormative sex. Carrie Mulligan says of the character in a DVD comment, Troy is all about sex, and clearly Bathsheba needs something more than that. Gabriel offers the physical beauty of a body guy, but he's also good around the farm. Bathsheba tellingly complains that her new husband, Troy, doesn't do proper farm work. That Sheen's Boldwood is to take the role of mind guy may be indicated from his first appearance at the corn exchange, where he brushes off the presence of Bathsheba by turning to the men around him and saying, Gentlemen, shall we get back to business? Bathsheba is clearly bothered by this snub, and when Liddy tells her that Boldwood is thought to have had his heart broken by being jilted long ago, Bathsheba's response is telling, Women don't jilt men, men jilt us. Bathsheba seems distressed that this man has taken on a role normally occupied by women, and her joke Valentine comes across as appropriate tit for tat. She will now take on the role of male, she will now take on the male role of pursuer. This exchange of gender roles, albeit somewhat stereotypical roles, between Bathsheba and Boldwood would seem to be no accident. Earlier, it was shown that Mulligan's Bathsheba frequently plays the male, even to wearing somewhat masculine clothes. Sheen's Boldwood, like Schoenart's Gabriel, never puts on any feminizing garments, but to him are assigned behaviors that are usually thought to be feminine. As was true of Peter Finch's Boldwood in 1967, Sheen's character never faces Bathsheba after she ends the understanding, and he never collapses into a kind of existential void, unless it is in the scene where he shoots Troy and promptly marches to the jailhouse. Instead, this Boldwood is given two key scenes where he is allowed to express his deepest feelings, but they are not expressed to Bathsheba. Rather, they are given to Gabriel. The first such scene occurs after the rainstorm, when Boldwood makes a cautious appearance at Bathsheba's farm. Gabriel halts him, and again, in pointed contrast to Peter Finch, Boldwood confesses he is not well. With an anguished half-smile, he expresses fear that the town is laughing at him, and he emphasizes that he was not jilted. But this is prologue to a confession that Sheen delivers on the point of tears, I feel the most terrible grief. While Finch was stoic in showing Boldwood's desire to preserve Bathsheba's reputation, to Sheen's Boldwood, it is the pretense of his openly expressed heartbreak. The second emotional scene comes just before the Christmas party, as Gabriel helps the childishly nervous Boldwood with his tie. He even says to Gabriel, I'm shaking, I'm so nervous and he continues to prattle like a teenager on a first date. Does a woman keep her promises? Will she do what's right? This teenage-like ignorance of women, and especially his reliance on the manlier Gabriel, marks Boldwood as the loser in a game dominated by body guys and mind guys, alphas and betas. Boldwood himself acknowledges this when, after Troy's disappearance, he makes the following declaration to Bathsheba. I'm a middle-aged man willing to protect you for the rest of your life. When you're ready, I'm offering you comfort, shelter, a safe harbor as my wife. If you worry about a lack of passion on your part, a lack of desire, if you worry about marrying me mostly out of guilt and pity and compromise, well, I don't mind. Boldwood seems to believe that all a woman wants is security. What he doesn't seem to realize is that such a blatant appeal to guilt and pity and compromise would have no appeal to a modern woman up for a challenge. In an odd way, the film Boldwood's declaration here echoes, or perhaps mocks, Gabriel's declaration to Bathsheba when he proposes to her in chapter 4 of the novel. But I love you, and as for myself, I am content to be liked. The difference between the two is that even in settling for being liked, Gabriel is still demanding reciprocal good feelings. Boldwood is willing to be walked on. In the final analysis, 
The two films of Far From the Madding Crowd give us two very different views of Boldwood, a character who is brought to life by two actors who manage to speak to masculine fears of each era, age and obsolescence in 1967, an inability to measure up to other men in 2015. Yet as different as these interpretations are, they are not really far from Hardy's Boldwood, who is in fact a protean man, filled with all the possibilities of the individual, yet who collapses by being unable to live up to any of them. Thank you, Paul. It was wonderful to hear about my favourite man for so long. I just sat in the corner going squee the whole time.